Jenny Wiley was born as Jenny Sellards in the state of Pennsylvania in 1760. At the age of about 19 she and her family moved to Walker's Creek, Virginia, which is now Bland County. In 1779 Jenny met a young man named Thomas Wiley. They soon fell in love and got married. Thomas built a cabin they could use as a home. In this small two-room cabin Jenny and Thomas raised their four children, Hezekiah, Ruth, Naomi and Tommy. On the 1st of October 1789 her life was about to change forever. Her brother-in-law John Borders, who was married to Jenny's sister, was out working that day, most likely looking for sheep that went astray or working on his farm. In the morning sun he heard an owl hooting which was strange for this time of day. The hooting was coming from all directions, something was definitely not right. It was a group of Shawnee Indians signaling to each other. His mind started racing. He was without his guns or any other weapon, he was completely defenseless. Then he thought of Jenny being alone in her cabin, as her husband was at the trading post that day. He ran as fast as he could across the hill to warn her about the Indians. When he got to the cabin, Jenny was making clothing to prepare for the winter months. Terrified, he started to explain to Jenny how he had heard the hooting of an owl, and how it ended up being a group of Indians. He told her to gather up her belongings and take her children to his cabin because they would be safer there. Jenny agreed to come to his house that night, but she had to finish her weaving and do some chores around the house. John left her to go warn the others of the imminent attack from the Indians. When she had finished her weaving and housework, she started to gather up her possessions. Then catching her by surprise the front door sprung open. Standing in the doorway were a group of Shawnee Indians. They were hooting and shouting to one another, Jenny didn't know what they were going to do. Then she heard them say something about Mr. Harmon. Mr. Hoping it would save her life she said this is not the home of Mr. Harmon. It was no good as they couldn't understand her. She ran back into the room holding her baby as tight as she could. That's when the horror began. She was forced to sit and watch her children and younger brother be scalped by the Indians, and she couldn't do anything about it for fear of being killed herself. After they had got all the scalps latched to their side, one of the savages came after her, in an attempt to take her youngest baby from her which she was still holding close. After she refused to let go of her baby the chief black wolf called them off. After much arguing they set the cabin on fire and left with Jenny and her baby being forcefully dragged behind. Jenny was also pregnant at the time. Later that day, after dark, Jenny was exhausted, she was having a hard time keeping up as she was drenched from water soaked up in her skirt. The weight of the baby she was carrying, and the one she was pregnant with wasn't helping either. The baby was starting to get very sick. One of the Indians was starting to get very angry with her, and wanted to kill the baby, saying that this was slowing her down. Jenny pleaded with the chief to keep her baby alive. He defended her against this angry Indian, and said if she keeps up, both her and the baby lives. When they all finally laid down to sleep, they bound Jenny's hands and feet with strips of raw deer hide. She could not sleep, still deeply traumatized by what she had seen, she fell in and out of consciousness, now and then she would scream out. It seemed to her she could still see her children being tomahawked and scalped. The next day they stopped for food and to rest. This place of rest became a scene of terror for Jenny. What she saw take place there left her in a deeper state of despair. She saw the Indians make hoops of green boughs and over them stretch the scalps of her dead children and brother and hang them up to dry. They offered Jenny some food but she refused to eat. The baby was still very ill. The chief was also a medicine man. He went into the forest to gather herbs. He came back and boiled the herbs from which he made tea to give to the baby. As time passed Jenny grew weaker and weaker. She did her best to keep up for fear of the Indians killing her or the baby. 
Another day passed, Jenny had no appetite. Her suffering and fear that the child, now very ill, might die, affected her emotionally and physically. The Shawnee chief again showed interest in the child and told Jenny to grease it with bare fat, and also, to have it swallow some. This she did and the child soon seemed to improve. Upon seeing that Jenny's feet were blistered, the Shawnee chief made a concoction from white oak bark and had her bathe them, next morning she repeated the application. A night's rest and the lotion helped, and she felt more able to set out on another day's journey. Now the bedraggled Jenny was not the beautiful, vivacious woman she had been before starting. A description of her left by her son, ran as follows. She had coal-black hair, she was strong and capable of great exertion and endurance. She was of fine form and her movements were quick. Her eyes were black with heavy overhanging brows. She was above medium height. Her face was pleasant and indicated superior intelligence. She was persistent and determined in any matter she decided to accomplish. She was familiar with woodcraft and was a splendid shot with a rifle. They moved on a lot faster and walked on well after sunset. Soon they heard the sound of running water. After walking a few more steps they came to a river and Jenny was forced to swim across. Two Indians were on both sides of her to help her across. Jenny was on the verge of mental and physical exhaustion. Soon they finally stopped to rest and eat. This time when the Indians offered her food she took it and ate. One of the Indians that was watching for people following them came down the hill warning them that he thought they were being followed. This caused panic amongst the Indians prompting one of them to grab Jenny's crying baby from her arms. Holding its feet, he proceeded to swing the baby, bashing its head against a tree, killing it almost instantly. This was horrifying to Jenny. She fell to her knees in absolute despair. But the Indians did not stop, they continued on. They finally came to another river that was even bigger. Again she was forced to swim across the river with two Indians at either side helping her. It was critical to the Indians to put the river between them, and their enemies whom they feared were following them. They finally walked until they came to the Ohio River, and they could see the Shawnee village. But the river was flooded and its banks were overflowing which made it impossible to cross at the time. By now they had traveled about 100 miles through the wilderness. Since they couldn't cross the river Black Wolf, and the other Indians decided to go back into the Kentucky Hills to wait for the water to go down so they could cross later. They didn't stop until they reached their destination, in what is now known as Lawrence County, Kentucky. Here they made camp in Big Blaine Creek. It was a cold winter night and Jenny was placed in a big cave. Some time later in the night she gave birth to her baby. It is said she named her baby Robert Bruce. Jenny was forced to do the hardest jobs around the campsite, and after a while she even learned some of the Indian language by listening to them talk. One day she was doing her chores when a group of Indians came up to her and told her it was time for her baby to take the test of the waters. This would tell if her baby would become a warrior. They started breaking sticks from underbrush and made a raft to put the baby on. They placed the baby on a piece of bark and said if the baby cried he would be killed right then and there. But if he didn't cry he would grow up to be a strong and brave warrior, and would be raised in the ways of the Indians. In an attempt to save her baby Jenny grabbed him, and ran into the forest hoping to escape from the Indians. She was eventually recaptured and the Indians took her baby and placed him back on the raft as they had done before. The baby was confused and let out a little cry. The Indians heard it, and one of them grabbed him up by the heels and smashed his head up against a tree. Just as they had killed her other baby. As winter set in the Indians moved to a different campsite in present-day Johnson County, Kentucky. Here they were visited by other bands of Indians who brought them news of Harmon and his men. At this point Jenny was able to understand a little of the Indians' language. She heard what they were talking about and began to plan her escape. Sometime after the Indians had brought a young man into the camp and were going to burn him at the stake and torture him. 
Later she received news from one of the Indians that she too would be burned at the stake. She wouldn't let them see her upset and give them the satisfaction of seeing her break down. Her bravery impressed one of the chiefs, and he argued with Black Wolf to free her so he could have her as one of his wives and take her back to Tennessee. The chief took out his jewelry, trinkets, and all his valuable things he gathered from raids and laid them in front of Black Wolf on a blanket. Black Wolf finally granted permission for him to take her, and the two of them went to celebrate while Jenny was still in shock at what she just heard. Early the next morning they came to her and told her that they would be going on a hunting trip and would be a while before they got back. To be sure she wouldn't try to run away they tied her to a tree and left her there. The day went by so slowly. Later that day it started raining, the rain started soaking the hide they had used to tide her down with. She was slumped against the tree and this caused the hide to stretch. When she noticed this she began to work free of her restraints. Finally she got them off. She quickly ran into the forest and began to use what the Indians had taught her. She jumped into the first stream she came to and started swimming, so she wouldn't leave signs of where she went. The creek was very full of water from the rain, and in some parts it was very deep. Later the creek went into a larger body of water, and she was forced to swim to reach land. This spot was where the Indians had killed her other baby. Later this creek would be named after her. The creek split into two other streams. By luck or fate she turned in the right direction toward home. Soon Jenny was exhausted and couldn't go on any more. She crawled out of the creek and found a hollow log. Here she decided she would get inside the log and rest. There was relief and excitement running all through her body, and she found it hard to sleep. Finally she fell asleep. She had a dream of the young boy that was burned at the stake the day before. In her dream, she was lost and didn't know which way to go. The Indians were trailing not far behind her. Then the boy came to her and told her to keep going downstream and take the path that has wood chips from a white man's axe laying on the ground. Jenny woke from her dream. She was greeted by the sound of footsteps and human voices. The Indians had tracked her this far. She was terrified. They kept coming closer and closer. From what Jenny could hear, an Indian was standing right on top of the log in which she was laying. She looked at the mouth of the log and saw that while she had been sleeping a spider had woven its web closing her in. When the Indian saw this he didn't see any bother in looking in the log. The Indians finally started moving on, but the dog that they had with them was falling behind because he could smell something there. Jenny was praying the dog wouldn't give her away to the Indians. The dog came and put his snout in the log. Jenny didn't know what to do. She grabbed the dog's snout and held it shut so he couldn't bark. She stayed like this for what seemed like forever. Finally she let go of the dog and discovered she had accidentally killed the poor thing. She crawled out of her hiding place in the log and began on down the road. She went the opposite way that the Indians had gone. With what little strength she had gotten from the nap she took, she was running with all she could, as fast as she could. Her legs were going numb. She kept running. She didn't want to get caught by the Indians. Finally after all that running she came to a fork in the path. Not knowing which way to go she remembered her dream. The young boy had told her to go on the path in which she saw wood chips. She went down both paths for a short distance and finally on one she saw the wood chips. She quickly picked up her pace and started toward home. Still running and completely exhausted Jenny came to a river's edge. Across the river she saw a cabin. An old man came out onto the porch. Jenny started yelling frantically. Then she recognized the man. It was Henry Skaggs. She was yelling even louder by this time, help me. Save me from the Indians. Help me! Henry heard her cry for help and started making a raft. Finally he got it made and pushed it into the water. 
He told her to wade out into the water, and she did as she was told. He got beside her and pulled her up onto the raft. He paddled back to the other side with some haste, aware that the Indians could be right behind them. They didn't get halfway back to the other side when the Indians came bursting out of the forest. When they saw Jenny with Henry they thought about going after her. They figured that when they got to about halfway across the settlers would attack them so they didn't take a chance. They were shouting and yelling, when Henry saw them he picked up his gun and fired it at them. The Indians gave a war whoop and vanished into the forest from the direction they came. The other men were out on a hunt at this time of the day, but when they heard the shot go off they rushed back to the station to help. When they got there the storekeeper was pulling out some of his clothes for Jenny to put on and warm up. Jenny was reunited with her husband Thomas Wiley. They built another cabin where their other cabin had been burned to the ground. Eventually they moved to Kentucky. They had six more beautiful children. Jenny Wiley lived to be 71 years old. She died in 1831. Her grave can be found on a hill in Johnson County, Kentucky overlooking the Big Sandy River.